was a workout. <laughs> Thanks for all of those stanzas. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The text for the sermon is the gospel text from St. Matthew that we just heard. The curtain on our text opens in the wilderness of Judea where steady streams of people are traveling from Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region around the Jordan, that is the Jordan River, which is, when you think about it, just a bit odd. Because normally traffic flows from the wilderness into the city, not the other way around. So there's gotta be something going on out there, something that is attracting all of those from the city to go out to the wilderness. What is it? Well, there's a man out there, and his name is John, and he's preaching. In fact, he's been preaching out there in the wilderness some time before we tuned in this morning. And every day, every day people go out to hear John preach, and then they return to the city, and they tell their friends, and more people go out to hear him preach, and they return to the city, and they tell their friends, and before you know it, all Jerusalem and Judea and all the region of the Jordan were going out to hear him. So this is obviously before you could do a video of the sermon and post it on YouTube. Every day John would preach in the same text, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, prepare the way for the Lord and make his path straight. In one way or another, he would urge people to get ready to meet your maker. Don't delay. Stop procrastinating. Now is the time to get rid of all of those sneaky little reasons and excuses that you've been hiding behind. They may be effective for hiding your guilt from your neighbor, maybe even from yourself, but God sees right through it all, every, every single one of them. Now is the time to quit trying to cover up all of those ugly little truths about your life and stand naked before your creator. Rather than trying to hide your guilt and your shame behind all of those lame excuses, because you're afraid, you're afraid that if God were to hear them, he would zap you down dead. Confess them out loud. Bring them out from the hiding places and hold them up before the very face of God before he says to you, you think I don't know what's going on? You think I don't see it all? You think I don't see what you're trying to hide from me? And yet I don't understand why you do this. I just don't understand why. Is it because? Is it because you do not know that I am gracious and merciful, abounding in steadfast love, and how I would much rather forgive your sins than condemn you for them? Or is it that you know this, that you do know this, but you simply don't trust me enough to believe it. Every day, John would preach his sermon in the wilderness of Judea. And every day, people would go out to hear him and then they return to the city. And if anyone asks, what was today's sermon about? They'd say, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. And everyone would ask, but is it safe? And the answer would be, yeah, it's safe. And not only that, it'll set you free. And so we read, Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region around the Jordan were going out to him and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. It was all one action together. At once, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River while they were confessing their sins. 
So however you picture this scene, do not picture it in the same way as you do a Christian baptism. There's no going under the water three times in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. We're not there yet. John's baptism was a rite of purification that got you ready to meet your maker, your redeemer. But it wasn't the meeting itself. It just got you ready for it. But that's what today's big festival day, the baptism of our Lord, is all about. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. The Ark of the Covenant of the Lord was standing in the water. Once Jesus Christ enters into the water and is baptized, baptism becomes the very place where men and women and boys and girls meet Jesus. John knows who Jesus is. He knows he was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. They were cousins. Jesus had sent John to go ahead of him and baptize and get people ready. John had no problem with that whatsoever. But when Jesus insists that John baptize him, well, John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? But Jesus answered, let it be so for now. For thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. And then John said, if you say so. This episode marks the beginning of Jesus' public ministry. Everything before this was simply establishing the fullness of his divinity and the fullness of his humanity. But here is where the work that he has come into this world to do and to accomplish as fully God and fully man officially begins. So let's stop right there for a minute and let it sink in. How intriguing, how marvelous, how mysterious it is that his work begins here in the wilderness by being baptized in the same water in which Judea, Jerusalem, and all the region of the Jordan were being baptized while confessing their sins. If we are to understand the baptism of our Lord rightly for all of the bottomless comfort that it offers to the baptized, then we must understand that this is where our Lord has chosen to meet his people and unite himself to them in complete solidarity with them as he begins the work that he has come into this world to do for them. This is just the way that God works. He doesn't fix things from up in heaven or download patches to repair the virus. He comes down and he unites himself to man and us while we are confessing our sins into the water. By his baptism, Jesus has made holy baptism the place where he meets us and we meet him. Baptism is the place where he unites himself to us and we are united to him. To the end that, Whatever becomes of him becomes of us. We were therefore buried with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too should walk in newness of life. When Jesus entered into the water, he brought the whole triune Godhead into the water with him. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are present because it's never one apart from the other. Holy baptism is the place where men and women, boys and girls, meet the entire Trinity. The entire triune God meets us in the water. So in your baptism, 
The Holy Spirit descended on you just as it descended. He descended on Jesus. And we receive all of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, and most of all, the gift of faith. The change of heart by which that nature that is ours through Adam that rejects all that we have said so far in this sermon and in this service, that rejects it all as simply mumbo jumbo, but that now firmly believes that this is the truest and the surest thing that there is and there was and there ever shall be. In your baptism, the voice of the Father resounds in your heart with his words of full love and assurance, you are my child, and with you I am well pleased. Holy baptism gets its power to be what it is and to do what it does only because Jesus is baptized. Baptism would never have the power to do anything more than simply be a symbolic ritual if the one who takes away the sin of the world had not, not united himself to us in this way. Jesus is the word made flesh. As Luther famously puts it, apart from the word in the water, the, word, the water is just plain water and no baptism. But with the word of God, it is a baptism that is life-giving water, rich in grace and a washing of the new birth of the Holy Spirit. And that is what makes baptism such a dangerous thing. Or as we are more apt to put it around here, that is what makes baptism a sacrament. When Jesus was baptized, the power of God entered into the water with the baptized people of God. It was like, it was like putting a live high voltage cable into the water where everyone was bathing and it was instant death to everyone who was in the water. Apart from the cable in the water, it's just plain water and nobody gets hurt by it. But when the cable goes into the water, it becomes a deadly water. When Jesus was baptized, he brought his death on the cross into the water with him. And when you were baptized, you were united to his death so that his death became your death. Listen to this. You died while you were still alive. When Jesus was baptized, he brought his resurrection from the dead into the water with him. And when you were baptized, you were united to his victory over sin, death, and the power of the devil. Listen to this. You rose from the dead before you were buried in the ground. Or do you not know that all of you who have been baptized into Christ have been baptized into his death? For Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father so that we too might walk in newness of life. Luther wants to impress the earth-shattering thing that holy baptism is because Jesus Christ is in holy baptism. In his large catechism, Luther says this, imagine there was a doctor somewhere who understood the art of saving people from death or even though they died, could restore them quickly to life so that they would afterward live forever. Oh, how the world would pour in money like snow and rain. No one could find access to him because of the throng of the rich. But here in baptism, there is freely brought to everyone's door such a treasure and medicine that it utterly destroys death and preserves all people alive. There is more here than you can fit into one sermon, but if you got the patience for it, I'd like to make one more point before we park this thing. Maybe you have just begun to wonder if all of this talk 
about our Lord uniting himself to us and us being united to him in baptism isn't starting to sound just a bit like marriage. And if that's what you've been thinking, then good for you. There is a good deal here of the two becoming one flesh that happens in holy baptism and that reminds us, maybe even directs us, to holy matrimony. Once again, we're going to be drowned in the divine grace and love of God because it is not we who came to him with our proposal of how we could make his life so happy and full of joy and what a faithful bride we would be. But it is he who comes to us in the wilderness, not because we were so charming and beautiful, but while we were confessing our sin. Isn't it just like this holy bridegroom to come to she who is diseased and wretched and clothed in filthy rags only to call her my beloved and transform her into a beauty that makes the angels blush? Isn't it just like this holy bridegroom to come to you in your baptism to give you his name in fact, the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Here, Jesus takes you to be his beloved bride, to have and to hold from this day forward, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish, till death do us part, and by his resurrection from the dead, it never will, because Christ is risen. He gets down on his bended knee and says, I pledge you my faithfulness. And so we dare not look, we dare not look to the outward circumstances of our life. We dare not look to the inward faithfulness of our heart, to the feelings that are there to find assurance of our Lord's love for us, we look to our baptism. And our baptism is the place where he meets us and unites himself to us and gives us his death and his resurrection and his name and his unfailing promise. And so, so no wonder all Jerusalem and Judea and all the region around the Jordan were going out to John being baptized by him in the River Jordan, confessing their sins. Amen.